it's Stuart McPhee and I'm in Singapore this weekend for a Traders Summit uh, event uh, this weekend and uh, I'm joined today by Greg Morris. Greg, thanks very much My for joining me. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes of your time because I sat in on your excellent presentation today for a couple of hours and I did make uh, quite a lot of notes uh, about what you spoke about and I just wanted to um, ask you to perhaps uh, address those areas again sure. and, um, and perhaps help everyone else out there with some of the things you talked about. Now before I do, just let you know a little bit about uh, Greg. Um, you have written a couple of uh, written a couple of books, Candlestick Charting Explained and The Complete Guide to Market Breadth Indicators. You founded uh, Murphy Morris with your partner John Murphy um, back in 1995 and more recently he's now a fund manager with Stadium Money Management and they have over seven million dollars of assets under management. So, and I know from your presentation today, uh, what you do with those uh, funds is a very strict, disciplined approach to everything, the whole process, identifying opportunities and money management and, and certainly very much a trend-based, uh, trend-following based system. So perhaps we'll talk a little bit about that sure. uh, if we get to it. Um, the first thing I thought was really interesting today, you are talking about um, bull markets and bear markets and you had the table of all the major market falls and you said on average they're like about 18 months but the average time for them to recover is about three and a half years so you spoke about dead money and dead uh, uh, dead decades would you mind just perhaps explaining a little bit more about your well, studies I, and what I, you I found think, there? I think most people are surprised that uh, there are as many bear markets as we've had. I mean, the classic definition is a decline of 20% or more. Mm. And we've had, we've had many, many, many 20% moves in the markets. Mm. Uh, and then when you look at the average, and of course average is a very dangerous thing to use because uh, average is rarely average. Um, so you have 35% average declines they last about 18 months, but the thing that really surprises people is that it's three and a half, four years to recover from it. So you've got five and a half years if you were an index investor or a buy and hold buy and investor hold. Mm -hmm. where your money didn't go anywhere. And that's just the average. And that's happening, all, not all the time, happens. but it happens over happens and over again over history. You never know when. Uh, we've no. had two serious bear markets in the last 10 years. Mm. I get asked all the time if we're going to have another one. I say, I guarantee <laughs> Absolutely. you we will. Yeah. I just don't know when. Right. That's but right. Uh, in the rest of our lifetime, we're going to have another X number. Of course. It's going to be more than one. You can count on it. Absolutely. Yes. Hmm. Okay. So it's really that um, the whole idea of people thinking the market goes up over time. Um, well, Factually, theoretically, well, that, that happens. Wall but. Street likes you, likes everybody to think the market mm. always goes up over time, mm. and they'll use an 80-year average to show you that it has been up. But most people don't have 80 years to invest <laughs> no, in. No, they don't. But giant. then, of course, the issue with that is the constituents of those index or indices may not be in that index in 10 years' time. Of course, they may have moved on, been replaced by others. So, uh, yes. yeah, the market might over time. But 80 years, as you said, we don't have a lot of uh, no, unless time. you're a giant tortoise or something. Like that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, another interesting thing you spoke about today was the game that you mentioned, and I think it was like ten dollars to play. Oh, and if you yes, won, yes. how much did I win? A million dollars. Is that right? And yes. I could play it as many times. Well, you can set the game up anyway. What I was doing, I, I had talked about statistics. Hmm. Uh, how CNBC is always showing statistics, and how uh, you look at the up years in the Dow versus the down years in the Dow, and they're clearly two thirds of the time the market's up. And, and the point I was trying to make is those are just statistics. They're not really actionable information. So I said, let's play a game. Mm. Uh, it's $10 to play. Mm. If you win, you win a million dollars. You can play as much as you want, as many times as you want. Yes. Uh, it's a fair game, and the odds are you will win one time out of six. How many want to play? And I, I, I well, was the course, first to put my hand up. Everybody raised their hand. Mm. Uh, unless they're afraid to raise their hand because they know it's leading into a trick. Yeah. And then I say it's Russian roulette. And I say how many want to play now? And of course nobody wants to play because mm. Russian roulette. I have now changed their focus mm. from the statistics, these goofy statistics, to the risk of playing the game. And when they realize what the risk is, they're no longer interested in playing this game. And the same needs to be applied to the stock market. People focus on all the positive things that are oversold to them on the stock market, and they don't think about the risk of being in the stock market. So it's an attention getter. Yeah, it's great. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, another thing you spoke about was risk versus uncertainty. And just to, to let you know, the, the scenario was that um, there were five red balls and five blue balls. And um, you said, what was the risk of um, like pulling a particular colour well, out? Well, the, the, thing I was, the point I was trying to make is that risk and uncertainty are very different things. Mm. Risk is usually something that can be measured. Defined. So if you have a jar or an urn with five red balls and five blue balls, what are, what's the expectation of pulling out a red ball? Well, right. we all know it's 50-50. Yes. And that's measurable. Yes. We, we can actually do the probability study on it. Hmm. However, if you have a jar that has red balls and blue balls in it, you don't have any idea what the numbers are. Yes. What's the expectation of pulling out a red ball is still 50 50 mm, but, we just but, but it's completely un there's no mathematics that can describe that mm. that is uncertainty and the point being is next monday when the market opens you're dealing with uncertainty because nobody knows what it's going to do mm. Mm. Yep, very good um, now I know, but it wasn't in your slides, I don't think you told anyone today, and I don't know if there was a reason for that, but you're formerly a pilot, um, a naval pilot flying F-4s yes. in the 70s, and um, you and I have had discussions or emails previously about that, and I wanted to know how, if, if at all, being a pilot and what you've learned and what you've had to apply in that role has helped in any way, shape or form with the um, with your involvement in the market now. Oh, I, I think so, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be very disciplined to be a pilot and certainly stay alive as a pilot landing <laughs> on aircraft carriers. Uh, we always use checklists. Um, yeah, no, the, the discipline, I think, is probably the cri most critical thing. You know, I was talking about discipline today a lot, mm -hmm. and so it's a, you have to be disciplined to be a successful pilot. Mm. Now, I know it's a silly question, but I want to hear your answer. Why do you use checklists? Because you don't want to rely on your memory. A checklist is there because you need to complete certain things, and generally in a certain order. Uh, and when you start committing things to memory and there's outside influences that you might not have control over, mm. it's very easy to forget things like mm. that. Or if you have a checklist, it isn't. Okay, very good. Um, you mentioned also today a story about being on a, similar to today, I guess, being in a, a forum, being in an event where you had a, a lot of different big, heavy players in the industry being on a stage and all being asked the same question. And I think you mentioned Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, not that the names are that important, but and the question was asked about how would you react um, when the next recession comes, or if we have a recession, how would you react? And would you like to talk about like sure, your response sure. and different well, well, the point is, is that uh, uh, all these large investment banks, uh, they will give you long, expounded answers on what they would do if they to the, change their strategy if they think another recession is coming. And, and generally, it's just nothing but marketing, uh, because. And, and what what I say is, is that uh, he, with all the data out there and all the sharp people, economists, etc. Massaging this data, trying to predict what might happen. I don't, not just economically, but monetarily, politically, mm. financially. Uh, even, even if they're 100% correct in their prediction, they still don't know how the market's going to react to it. Mm. There's a mindset that if it's a positive event, that it's going to be positive for the market. Well, that, the market's completely uncorrelated with that. So mm. it's, it's just. We just, at Stadium, we just measure what the market's doing. And if any of those events do come true, we let the market go ahead and do what it's going to do, and then we react, react accordingly. Mm. Yes. Mm. Well, I think it was you just said today in your technical analysis slide about the uh, assumptions that the theorists make about efficient market hypothesis. And one of them was the invest uh, investors are rational. And I'm just trying to think what the first one was. The, uh, the markets are random. Right, and normally distributed. And, and investors are rational. And which means it's an efficient market. Efficient market, right. but of course both of those are not really true. No. Um, um, markets are not as efficient as people would like to think they are. Well, and I think there are times when you can see where the market is efficient, mm -hmm. but they're not. it's not in a way you can ever make an investment decision based and, on. And not consistently. Correct. And investors are far from rational oh, most times. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Never rational. Mm -hmm. um, well, which probably leads me into this, and why you use technical analysis. I thought you had a really good slide today about why you use technical analysis. Uh, we use it for many reasons. It keeps our perceptions clear. Uh, we know we're going to rely upon it, and, and uh, it removes the emotions. 
of the decision-making process. Uh, I, I think everybody at one time or another in their investing career has made emotional decisions. Of course. Yeah. Generally, they don't work out. And the more you make them, the more it doesn't work out. Mm. But the, the thing I think that's most important is, is that uh, technical analysis closes that gap between doing the analysis and taking action. And it then primarily it gives you discipline. And discipline is absolutely the most important thing that technical analysis does. It's just it's just a natural course of events with technical analysis. Hmm, fantastic. Okay. Uh, that's great. Look, just a couple more things. Sure. Um, you told so many jokes today, which was terrific. Well, no, there's a, there's a reason I do that. If yeah. I if I can tie a funny story with some, a point I'm trying to make, I kind of think that if you use humor, you're buying shelf space in the mind because they might remember the humor and mm. remember in, in the manner that it was given. So, yeah, no, and the, as I said, you said quite a few funny. Then you and Mark having a good crack at each other today yes. too, which is good, yes. Mark Cook. Um, would you mind just uh, repeating one for me, please? And that was the, oh, gosh. Um, you're talking about the gas station and filling up and how you've been on a uh, Oh, well, that was, uh, yeah, I was, I was talking about this one mm. when I did that. Mm. And uh, I, I said that I'd been on a diet my entire adult life and my wife and I were driving in the mountains and I stopped at a filling station to get gas and it was an old station. I had to go inside to pay for the gas and I buy myself a candy bar and I come back out and I'm eating it. And she gives me that look, you, you know that look. I do. <laughs> and she said, you just don't have any discipline. And I said, you know, that's not true because you don't know how many of these I wanted. And the point of it, I'm, what I'm leading into is that everybody knows whatever methodology you use in the markets, uh, you need discipline. Uh, everybody knows that. But discipline is something that has to be ingrained in the process. It can't be something you just decide, oh, I'm going to be disciplined today. It, <laughs> no. just, it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. Mm. Okay. All right, very good. Have you used that one for a while, that joke? Oh, maybe 15 years. <laughs> it still works, huh? It still works, It's yes. a timeless. Yes. Um, and the last one, I'm going to trouble, have trouble finding the slide here. It's about the components. You, you talk about oh, three components sure. of your model. Sure. Like rules and... It's, uh, I, and that's not just our model. I think mm. that's the, those are three components to use for any type of model. But we're trend followers. And uh, the, the first component, it's like a three-legged stool. It's the most stable type of stool. Uh, the first component, one leg of the stool, is, is a measurement of what the market is doing. That was that weight of the evidence process I was telling you about. Mm. The second leg of the stool, the second component, is a set of rules and guidelines to know how to trade that market movement. Yes. And then the third and equally important, and sometimes I say even more important leg of the stool, is the discipline to follow it. With confidence, mm -hmm. and so all three, three of those together are required. You take any one of them away, I, th I think it would fail. The, mo the whole model process would fail. Mm. Um, if we mind just finishing off with one more point, and that's, um, I think people hear the word discipline all the time. Um, how do people become disciplined? Do you think they're born with it? Do they develop it? Do they make a conscious effort to do it? Um, where does an individual out there who might be just struggling to sort of get a plan together and? get some traction and start well, moving forward. I think uh, just like Mark Cook was talking and like what, what I said, we've got a set of rules and guidelines that tell us how to trade our way to the evidence measure. Mm. That it, if we are mandated to follow those rules and guidelines, that has built discipline built in. In sure. other words, our whole goal is to remove the subjectivity from the process. Sure, sure. And, and when you do that, you have no opportunity to not be disciplined. Should an individual with him perhaps uh, approach it similarly, where they say, oh, yeah. right, Definitely here's my set of rules, here's my plan, I now have a mandate, I have a responsibility to myself it's, to, to yes. follow this. Well, it's, it's that I gave that example. I said it, just a crossover with a 200-day average mm. followed with discipline, most people would be more successful than, than what they are now. They are because they, what, what happens is you'll get three or four whips all in a row and they give up. Mm. When, no, they don't when that's with just exactly the time they should have stuck with it. Yes. Yeah. So. You know, one one of the things I've found is you give someone such a simple approach like that, they almost subconsciously dismiss it because they're convinced that trading is more difficult than that and should that's be more exactly complicated. Right. Yes. And they'll subconsciously go, no, I don't think that'll work. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I was saying yeah. uh, it's like an Occam's razor I was yeah. mentioning. I love that. The term. simpler of two theories is generally the generally, better theory. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Occam's just, razor. Uh, 
you should always keep it as simple as possible. The more complex it is, the greater chance it has of failing. Mm. Mm. So. Yeah, and, and we have trouble implementing it too often when it's sure, a more sure. difficult set of rules. And we give ourselves more out, you know, more excuses to not follow and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, all right, Greg, fantastic. I didn't want to take too much of your time. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. And uh, it's been a really good day today, I thought. Um, yes. You spoke for two hours. Mark spoke for two hours. And I thought some of the things you said was just absolute gold. Um, but just from experience and the time you've, and the different stages, the different market conditions you've seen over years, sure. um, has just been very, very enlightening. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And um, I hope you've been able to learn uh, something from that. If you want to have any um, uh, comments or questions, please post, post them below this video and, uh, and we'll respond to those. Thanks very much. Thank you.